engagement. We make her one of our favorite books on the intersection of food, politics, and culture and invite one of the authors to speak with us. So every once in a while, a cookbook comes out that really showcases beautiful food, but it also like shows us a different way of relating to food and a different way of being. And Brian Terry's latest book, The Vegetable Kingdom, The Abundant World of Vegan Recipes, is one of those books. And actually, I think that all of your books fit into that category of showcasing and illuminating a different way of being and thinking. Um, this book, The Vegetable Kingdom, is more than just a collection of vegan recipes. It's a love letter to your daughters. It's a reflection of their mixed heritage. It is a celebration of just like what plants can be and taste like. It is a subtle but unabashed decolonizing of vegan eating. And it's just a celebration of culture. So thank you for writing it and congratulations. Uh, yeah, I, I, so this book is, um, so my last book, Afro Vegan, was published in 2014. So it's been six years between books. And I, I just feel like it's important to say that while I was getting a lot of pressure from handlers, publicists, agent, editors to write another book, publisher, it was really important for me. I very intentionally took off those six years because I will say this, if anyone is interested in writing a book, a cookbook, the cookbook writing process is isolating, protracted, and grueling. It's not fun at all. I will say that. I'm not going to compare it to that given childhood. I won't even disrespect that process. But I will say this. If I could recall how horrible the, the kind of many of the moments when I'm writing this book was, I probably wouldn't do it again. But it's moments like these that I reflect on. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do, this. I want to do another book because I get to see all you awesome people coming out and supporting. So, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I just, you know, like our youngest daughter, Mila. Uh, she, we started her at cello when she was three. And I take pride in the fact that I have taken her to almost every single one of her cello lessons and been to all of her recitals. Like, my parents, it's cliche as they sound, they always like, you never get the young age up those years back when they're little like that. And I really take that seriously. And I think it's been so amazing being able to bond with them and connect with them. And part of the reason that the book is dedicated to them is because I dedicated so much time to them just having a lot of daddy daughter time and it just kind of organically happened because I'm like, yeah, I like feeding them the most, so they would be eating the food that is in my next book. <laughs> okay, so Brian Terry, you're a father, clearly. You're an educator, you're a chef, you are a mentor, you're an activist, you are also the chef in residence at the Museum of African Diaspora here in San Francisco. Um, can you tell me about like the arc of your work and what, what came first? Yeah, so, I'll say this, I think it's important to note that I always frame the work that I'm doing as helping people remember many of the practices that our ancestors had, you know, just by show of hands. How many people in the audience have had people in your family who were smallholder farmers, who had farms at some point? How many people had home gardens? Do you have family members that actually made food from scratch, did, did things like can, pickled and preserved, things like that. So a lot of these practices that I think are presented as like the things that we should be doing to help, you know, connect with real food, to help us, you know, make our way back on the path to more healthy and sustainable food system. These are things I grew up with. You know, I grew up in the South. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. And my family came from the rural South, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas. We own farms. And so when my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, when they came to Memphis, as many people migrated from the rural South to the urban South, they obviously brought with them the connection to the land, the survival uh, instincts, the traditional agrarian knowledge. So these were things that they implemented in the context of the city. So my my paternal grandfather, you know, more than a garden, I say he had urban farm. Every bit of available space in his backyard was being used to produce food. And I'm not gonna romanticize it, trust me. Like they were definitely kind of doing some child labor exploitation when they were getting all the grandkids to go out there and like plant food and pick weeds and harvest and shut corn and shell peas and all that. But you know, those are some of my fondest memories. And I feel like the lessons that I learned there, like, you 
know, obviously the seed the table cycle, you know, just the benefits of kind of like planting a seed and the benefit of, you know, seeing your the fruits of your labor. But everything I'm doing is kind of like helping people get back to these practices that I think a lot of our ancestors had at some point. And so um, that's the beginning, and I think that's important. But in terms of like my kind of political entree in this work, there are a couple moments. One was when I was in high school. So even though I, I think the type of food that we were eating is the type of food that I think most yeah. Western trained physicians or allopathic physicians or you know dietitians or uh, dietitians or uh, three, two, one. Are you editing this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> so most of the type of food that we were eating is the type of food that I think any Western trained allopathic physician or dietitian or uh, nutritionist would say that everyone should eat. And that's the thing. You know, one of the things that my work has been pushing back against are these kind of like reductive ways in which people frame African American cuisine. So, so often, well, here are the two strains that I, I found. So when people talk about black food, what they often are imagining are two things. One, people talk about the kind of antebellum survival food that the enslaved Africans had to you know, subsist on, right? And so the argument that I've heard, even among many African Americans, is like, you know, soul food? Because when people say soul food, I think they're imagining black food. That's the kind of like, for them, it's synonymous. You know, soul food, that's the black people food or whatever. The black people. Uh, and so, People will say, you know, well, that's slave food. Because obviously, you know, in different parts of the South, the Black Belt, like, there was a more paternalistic system where every need of enslaved Africans was provided by the plantation owners, right? Clothing, shelter, food, and a lot of the food that enslaved Africans would get would be the remnants of the food that the, the people, the plantation owners, the people in the big house would have. So they get the, like, discarded vegetables. Alice! So this is Alice Waters. Yes, I was also talking all about the school food initiatives and the center in Sacramento and just all that made so So everybody, on, everybody here agreed that they're gonna um, somehow use their time, their talent, or their treasure to help with the organization and the work that you're doing. Right, guys? <laughs> Love you, thank you. Wow. Um, thought I was spaced 30 minutes ago. I can't even like, ground myself now. Okay, okay so there anyway. is uh, antebellum type food where you get the remnants of what they cooked in the, in right. the house. So, you know, the, the worst parts of the vegetables, the worst parts of the animals, you know, the, the internal viscera. And so the problem with that framing is that it's, it's ahistorical in that it doesn't recognize that the institution of slavery wasn't a monolith. I know I'm digging deep on some history here. Are you guys interested in this stuff? Okay. So it wasn't a monolith. So yes, in certain parts of the South, there was a more paternalistic system, but in certain places like the coastal Carolinas, Louisiana, the institution of slavery looked different in the Caribbean. And so, you know, on Sundays in some parts of uh, the South of the Caribbean, you might have a day off. You might have your own plot of land where you can grow your own food. So this whole idea or notion that, well, you know, soul food or black food, that's just slave food. We need to move beyond that is erroneous. But then the other framing that I see is when people talk about soul food or black food is what they're thinking about. They're talking about the comfort foods of the cuisine, right? The deep fried fatty meat, the sugary desserts, the things that people would have on holidays and celebrations. <laughs> Okay. So the reality is, is that before the industrialization of our food system, most working class and working poor black folks, or working class and working poor folks in general, couldn't afford to have meat at every single meal. This is something that you have on Sundays when it was a family dinner, or if there was a big holiday, or there's some type of like massive celebration. And even when I dig into the, you know, doing research into different cuisines in Sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of the Caribbean, the American South, and just wherever black folks have traveled, so many of these cuisines are largely vegetable based, right? Meat was used, but as in many traditional food, but food, uh, and <clears throat> as in many traditional cuisines, it was used as a supplement. It was used to deepen flavor. It was used to add some nutrient density. And so, you know, 
when we were shopping my first book, uh, Vegan Till Kitchen, my first solo book around, we shopped at the 12 publishers. 10 said outright no. No, this is ridiculous. Vegan, soul food, that's oxymoronic. Black people don't eat vegetables. And so there was one who wanted to do a book that was completely not the book I wanted to do, and one understood the vision and invested in it. And so here we are. And just speaking to that a little bit, when you think about why there's this misperception of, of black food being super meat-based and not healthy and not like even being like rooted in vegetables, it's also what I remember that when when folks are being enslaved, like they bring in seeds into their hair, like seeds and grains of rice are brought over so many like vegetables and, and things that we have now. So America would have rice if it wasn't for the people who brought little pieces of hope with them. I mean, well, to be clear, I don't know if people know this, but there wasn't some random kind of like plucking of, of, of Africans that were then enslaved and brought to the Americas. There was specific agricultural knowledge that many of these Africans had, and they were brought here to employ that knowledge. And so I think, you know, we need to talk about that, but if we're have, if we have to, if we're gonna have an honest conversation about our food system in general, we have to start from this place, and when Leah Pittman, uh, the farmer and activist and author of Farming While Black, brilliantly discusses this in her new book. We need to start by recognizing that our broken food system is built on stolen native land. This is the land that was stolen from native people, and so this whole runaway food system that we talk about, kind of correcting in whatever way we imagine that, is stolen. Further, enslaved Africans were brought here in order to help prop up this agricultural system. And we think about the role that they played, even in, you know, kind of like bolstering modern capitalism. We need to recognize that. And so conversations that, you know, I think some of the most brilliant organizations that are talking about food are not just talking about food, but they have an intersectional analysis and they're talking about the many forms of oppression and the many ways in which structurally our food system is broken. People don't have access to food. And I think about movement generation, who's right here in um, the San Francisco Bay Area. I think about the movement for black lives. Like these are organizations that are talking about racial justice and talking about things like how we reimagine our relationship to energy and land and think about things like addressing climate change. We're talking seriously about reparations because once again, we can't have serious conversations about what's broken in so many areas of our um, country if we don't talk about the reality that the institution of slavery, the, the, the hundreds of years of free labor that it's a doctrine provided for this country is what gave capitalism its kind of like boost. And so, um, and that's what about like the reaction to oppression, the reaction to these different forms of, uh, you know, isms, or even if we think about like this reality of like African Americans having some of the highest rates of preventable diabetes, heart, heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes. What I've seen a lot of people doing is kind of approaching food in this utilitarian way, right? So either like, we need recipes for resistance, we need to be fighting back, or we need recipes that are gonna give us like the nutrient density so that we can be helpful and, and thriving and it's all that. But I don't want people to forget that food is about pleasure. Food is about like enjoyment. And so that has to be something that I think we are keeping one eye on as we're thinking about how we can use it to resist, to heal ourselves. It's about survival, it's about resistance, but it's also just about enjoying. And, and Alice, who just came up, talks about enjoying the sensual pleasures of the table and how they can bring people together. So I, I really don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah. Like I think revolution should be also based in pleasure. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Where do we go from here? I feel like we covered so much already. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you bridge activism and cooking. So, yeah, what are the lessons you've learned maybe from being from doing activism work that you can apply to your like work in the kitchen and vice versa? Yeah. Well, I'll say this. So I started an 
organization in New York City back in 2002 called Be Healthy. And we work with young people, mostly young folks of color from the lower economic strata of New York. They came from like Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens. Uh, these are kids who are coming from neighborhoods that are historically marginalized. And I, I, I need to say that, you know, most communities that have very little access to healthy, fresh, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, in these same communities, you have crumbling infrastructure, under-resourced, segregated public schools, very few jobs. The jobs that are available often don't get living way. Very little green space for people to be active and have just beauty in neighborhoods. So I say that to say that lack of access to healthy, fresh, affordable, and closely appropriate food is simply one indicator of material deprivation. Most communities, it's not like you go to a community and it's like, whoa, we don't have like a supermarket or some places are getting fresh food, but we have amazing public schools and like, you know, the roads are strong and we have like lots of jobs. They're all connected. And I don't think we can talk about food in isolation without recognizing that we need to address all these innumerable issues. But in terms of, you know, the young people, and this is directly related to the young people that we work with at Be Healthy, like these are young people who are coming to an after school program from these under-resourced, uh, segregated public schools that they just weren't getting the care and attention that they needed, like the Oakland Community School that was ran by Erica Huggins in the 1960s, the flagship program, the Black Panthers uh, survival program. And so, what I found is, is that the least effective way of public thinking about changing their habits and their attitudes and politics around food was just talking to them, right? They're like, we need something more engaging. And so, <laughs> so what we found was, if we took these young people to different sites, because our whole thing was how can we use cooking as a way to excite them? First to change their own personal relationship with food, but then to go back to their own community and think about how they can shift the, the relationship with food in their community through, through uh, pure education and community organizing. But we had young people who, under any other circumstance, wouldn't want to eat fresh fruits or vegetables, but when we took them to urban farms, and community gardens and different sites throughout New York City that had fresh food and we involved them in the process of harvesting it or choosing it and then we brought it them back to the door of the center where they were based in in North Manhattan and they cooked the food, they always tried it. They had an investment in trying it because they were part of this process and so I do it with my children, I do it with children uh, that I work with in different programs. Like this whole process of getting them involved, not just in the cooking, but getting their hands in the soil, getting them like deeply invested in it, and they'll try it. And the more they try fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, fresh cooked food, the more that it opens up their palate and they're excited to actually try more. So I think that's a great way to start. Because you can talk about the food politics, but sometimes it just like shuts people down. But when you bring them to the table to cook, get people more excited. <laughs> Yeah. And why did you start with young people? Um, well, one of the reasons I started with young people is because I think that it's criminal that, you know, these multinational food corporations. So, so first of all, just so people are clear, there are four or five multinational food corporations that control more than half of our food system globally, right? This is a problem. Because when you have like a handful of corporations, this type of concentration of our food system, what can they do? They can do things like set pricing, right? They can determine, you know, what seeds are available to us. They're patenting seeds. They can sue you if you grow their seed that they patent it. They can do things like manipulate our understanding of what's even healthy. You know, these ne nebulous terms that they use like healthy and natural. There's no legal definition for these things, and so. We need to be like challenging capitalism in this way because we shouldn't have a food system that's controlled by so few corporations. But one of the things that's so criminal to me is that the fact that these companies aggressively market the worst foods and worst drinks to our children. They're spending a billion dollars every hour marketing high fat, high sugar, high salt, processed, packaged, and fast food 
to children. And especially to black and brown children. Black and brown children can eat twice as many of these oh. as the a white child. Yeah. So they're they're expanding the market, they're concentrating in the most vulnerable communities. And so obviously we need some legislation in order to kind of curb that type of aggressive market. We talked about it in the Be Healthy program I started is a form of psychic violence. Because when these children come out of their house, or even before they leave their house, probably on their devices, they're seeing ads, billboards, jingles that are telling them to eat and drink the worst foods, right? I can't compete with that. Because I think the argument that these companies might make is that, <coughs> well, parents should be responsible for the kids. These, we're the ones who are, you should be shaping their desires and determining what they're gonna eat. I can't compete against a billion dollars. I don't think most parents can compete against that. And so I think, we need to ensure that you know these type of um, aggressive ways of capturing the minds of young, vulnerable, uh, impressionable children. There's policies in place to prevent it. So. Yeah, and just a side note, that whole like, oh, the parents should be responsible. <coughs> they used to think that with lead paint too. So like in the 50s, there would be like these ads, like, oh, like if like the parent needs to like watch out for their kids, make sure they don't like eat anything with lead paint in it, which is ridiculous. It's not. Like the problem with capitalism again is they always make it up to it's always up to the individual as opposed to like the institution or the collective. Yeah. Okay, so I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about some of the misperceptions around soul food. Um, one, I want to know, like, why do you think there is this? I mean, there, you told us some reasons why there's misperceptions, but like, who stands to gain from this mis misperception of what soul food is? Who stands to gain? Um, like, do you think that that's a way, maybe it's a way of like othering a certain type of person or a certain type of cuisine or... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, and frankly, I don't really put on it as a whole chance of game from it, but I know who loses, and who loses, we all lose from it, because we all have this misperception that we don't get to... Oh, so I'm sorry, let's just keep trying, because I want to... I think that, because what I found is that there's this kind of like bifocal approach that I have to take around educating people about the, the true origins of cell food. And so it's not just that the wider culture needs to be re-educated about you know, the, the diversity and complexity of the type of food that African Americans have you know, grown, cultivated, and consumed you know, from the time that folks have landed here. But it's people of African descent as well. Yeah. You know, people, black folks have their own misperceptions and misunderstanding of what our food is. And when someone will tell me that, you know, this type of book is somehow written through, and, and I'm just being like completely transparent about like a, a kind of critique I saw somewhere. I don't, I don't think it was on uh, a comment. No, it wasn't this one, it was actually my last book. It may have been a comment on Amazon.com. Don't read those. Things. <laughs> I'm crazy. Um, no, sorry, I can't say that. People are just in their own thing. They're in their own world. Um, but someone said something about like, oh, you know, that book is written through the white lens. He's like, there somehow he's writing it with the, with the white gaze in mind because you know this isn't soul food. I want more like barbecue tofu and like you know just like the kind of stereotypical foods that I think people often associate with African Americans and so it, it it hurts me that people don't know our own history and the kind of agrarian based you know traditions that we have and the, the vegetable centric food that we see throughout regions of the American South and like I said throughout the African diaspora and so you know I'm always thinking about how I can kind of ease people into this understanding and once again for me recipes are such a powerful way to do that you know some any intellectual lecture may resonate with some people, but some people don't want to hear that. But I, I found that if I present, you know, a dish and then people are just like, this is amazing, what is it? And then I can talk to them about the history of it, you know. Um, for example, you know, one of the, the dishes in here, one of my favorite dishes in this book is called Big Beans, Buns, and Broccoli Rock. And so, I'm not a baker, but I actually make a homemade bun for this, and the bun, is filled with um, some of Steve Sandoz. You guys know Rancho Gordo, please? Rancho Gordo. Uh, 
awesome. Um, so they're royal corona beans that have been uh, cooked until tender, and then they are simmered in this rich tomato-based gravy with diced potatoes, and then it's the the bun is top of that, and then we take broccoli rabe, and we either um, grill it or um, roast it in an oven, and that's kind of like the replacement for what might typically use lettuce in a sandwich. And the, the origin of this recipe is bunny chow. And bunny chow is a traditional South African dish that uh, laborers would often have. And, and, and what they would do is take a loaf of bread and then hollow the loaf of bread out and fill it with a curry. And originally it was a vegetable-based curry. You know, I think lima beans was the foundation, but kind of as it evolved, more meat-based curries were used. And so when I think about a dish like that, I think about the kind of like portable foods that we see throughout different cultures that people use, working people. You know, whether it's like empanada or, uh, you know, hand pies in the American South, or tamales, like these quick, portable, nutrient-rich food that if you're a worker, you can take it, you can stuff it in your pocket and keep it moving. And so, you know, I, I like to think that the recipes are more than just about sustenance, but they're about teaching people history, they're about sharing memories, and really giving, like, you know, the, the reader kind of a full, um, sensual experience, but also kind of like, educating them at the same time. Yeah, it's a twofer. So in this book, um, for many of your previous books, it was really about the African diaspora and like and Southern cooking and soul food. And I feel like this book also includes some uh, more, <laughs> some more, this book also includes some more Asian influences. And as a person who is black and Asian, it feels, it was really nice to see myself like, or see myself somewhat represented in a book yes. that I've never ever seen before. Um, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted to know um, just a little bit more about how did you get some of those recipes from from like the, like the Asian inspired recipes? Where did you pick those up from? What was the inspiration? Yeah. So uh, my wife is Chinese American, and we have two Afro Asian children. And so you know, I think we both we we, we understand the ways that we can teach our children about themselves through food. And so I'm obviously doing it through the African diaspora food, and my wife does it through different Asian cuisines. I don't know, Chinese food that she grew up cooking, and she's also really adept at Thai, Lao, uh, Vietnamese, Japanese, so we just kind of have like a very Asian and African diaspora uh, palette that we pull from. And, you know, I just, I, I think in general, so often, especially with black food, it's just, at the margins, and when people think about food cultures, they're, they're thinking about European cuisine, or even in the health, you know, kind of like in the um, the health food world, or like when you think about eating more vegetarian and vegan, a lot of it falls towards like Asian food because of the development of the movement in the 1970s, macrobiotics was kind of ascended within um, like the health food world, and so I just wanted to do something that's kind of like modern that blends these cuisine, but not in like a corny and contrived way, yeah. but it's just organic because it's the way that we eat at home. Like we might have uh, soup noodles, right? Like ramen or pho, but then rather than adding like dao choy or bok choy, we might add collard greens, right? And so it's just kind of like this, um, this kind of like collages approach to cooking that I think um, just works for us because these are the foods that we're growing in our garden. These are the foods that we buy at the Grand Lake Farmers Market in Oakland, and we just try to celebrate the uh, spectrum of flavors oftentimes in the same meal. Okay, so um, has anyone been to the Museum of African Diaspora? And has anyone been to one of the chef and residence events at the museum? Okay, well, if you haven't been, sounds like a lot of you haven't, I highly recommend going. I These are one of my favorite events to attend. Um, there are a lot of food events like working in local media and a lot of them are mentally stimulating but none of them really stole, like, stir my soul in the way that your events do. I always come feeling, I always leave feeling so like alive and energized and just happy that I do what I do and that there's like this amazing community of folks there. So real quick plug, go to an event um, and I want to know what does it mean for a museum to even have a chef in residence? Yeah. So, um, you guys know Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco? They started an artist residency program uh, several years ago, and I think Anna DeVere Smith was the first artist in residence. So, uh, Mark Andrews, the bishop, contacted me about being the third 
artist in residence there. And what I did was I created programming for the wider face community. And just the, I mean, you know, they have a lot of programs that are open to the community and not just the face community. And so I would do things like, you know, have panels where we bring in different authors and talk about their work or, you know, I'd actually do meals at the church. So a range of programming, but Linda Harrison, who is the former director, uh, executive director of MOAD, was a member. And so when she got wind of my programming there, she, uh, she contacted me and she said she wanted to create a program at the museum that's dedicated to thinking about health and farming issues that she wanted to run it. So she essentially created this position for me. And, you know, I, I just want to say, in a city like San Francisco, with such a, a rapidly dwindling population of black people, you know, we know that the out-migration of black folks in the city has caused a population to drop from about 13, 13%, maybe a little over a decade ago, but fewer than 3% right now, right? So there are not a lot of black people in San Francisco living here anymore. And I think that the work that the museum is doing is vitally important for kind of just like holding that space, providing uh, physical space and programming for people of African descent before all of us to come and learn. And you know, doing this program around food has been so amazing because one, it's given me the opportunity as a man who has a certain level of privilege and power within the food uh, publishing industry, which is to use my platform to uplift women. You know, you think about, in general, like many of the people who have been upholding our food system in kitchens and fields, there have been women. And then, once again, their, their labor has been erased. Uh, they don't get compensated in the ways that they need to then and now. And so the first program that I had at the museum was called Black Women Food Power. And we brought in some scholars, some cookbook authors, of chefs and a farmer to talk about the historical and the contemporary role of black women in the production and the distribution and the consumption of both food and food knowledge. Because we have these scholars who are producing food knowledge around um, African historic food. And so we've done everything from have like intimate conversations like this with authors, panel discussions. We've done dinners inside the museum. Uh, we partnered with the St. Regis to do um, events. But you know, the thing that's been so exciting to me is that we get probably half a dozen emails every week from institutions around the country who have heard about this program and they're just like, we want to know more. And so, you know, some people are thinking about ways that they can full on create like a kind of chef residency where you have someone who's creating programming around these issues. But other institutions are like, we just want to include more programming that focuses on food. Even though we're not a food institution, we know that this is one of the most vital issues that we also be thinking and caring about. And so I like to think that um, just on that level, it's been highly successful in terms of creating a model that has inspired other institutions to think about like, food is important, let's make it part of the program that we're doing. So for the last question, we're running out of time. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm curious, so there's always so much like there's so much stuff happening in the world constantly and it feels a little amped up right now um what is something that gets you hope? i think what is giving me hope is that uh Invested young people. I think if we look throughout history, or we can just look at the 20th century, some of the most successful social movements, young people, their energy, their vigor, their brilliance, that has helped these movements like really push forward. You know, we can think about like 
the anti-apartheid um, movement in South Africa. We can think about the civil rights movement here in the United States. Young people, they've been like the ones who really like given. I mean, if we think about like what the Black Panthers, who have been so instrumental in inspiring the work that I do, like you know, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. I think most of us know who they are. We're in the Bay Area. The Black Panther, so I call them the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense because that was their original name, right? They were responding to police violence. They were responding to the same issues that we have today where you have black, mostly black men who are being detained, who are being uh, often abused and sometimes killed. There are a number of high profile cases in which this was happening. And so what they did was they responded by patrolling the communities with shotguns to police the police. And so they would watch them from a safe distance as they were detaining and arresting black folks to make sure that they weren't uh, violating their rights. So what happens is that the mainstream media, they circulate the images of the earliest moment of the Black Panther Party for self-defense, right? Just like any our organization or individual, we grow, we change, we evolve. That was 1966 when it was founded by Hugh and uh, Bobby Seale. But what I want to shift people's gaze towards is some of the most important work that the Black Panthers were doing, which were their survival program. They had 65 programs that were aimed at meeting the basic needs of people living in community. They did everything from you know having free ambulance services, they would transport people to hospitals, they had free clinics, they were doing medical care, they had simple cell anemia testing, because this is a disease that largely impacts people of African descent. They had, uh, this was free, this was free Uber and Lyft, free ride share. They would have cars that would transport elderly people to their doctor's appointments, to the um, grocery store to get their um, food, to visit family members. But the programs that they had that sat at the intersection of poverty, malnutrition, and institutional racism were the ones that inspired me the most, right? They did grocery giveaways, where they were giving away bags of groceries to low-income residents in the Bay Area. Look, same issues back in the 60s, like hunger, you know? Like, people not knowing where their next meal was coming from. So they would give away food, but then they had their free breakfast for children program, which was aimed at feeding children a hot, nourishing breakfast every single day, right? So in 1968, they started this program, and by the end of the year, I think it was started in January of 1968, by the end of the year, this program spread to every, from Oakland, California, right across the bridge. This humble program spread to every single city that had a Black Panther chapter, and they were feeding over 10,000 young people every single morning, right? And they knew, it was, they didn't need any peer-reviewed medical studies to know the connection between nutrition and academic outcomes and nutrition and behavioral outcomes. And as Erica Huggins reminds us, one, it was mostly women who were running these programs. Because the images we see are the like angry, gun-toting, uh, militant men. But there were women who were doing the labor, running these programs, often, you know, volunteering their time. Is Erica Huggins, who ran the um, Oakland Community School, which was the flagship program of the um, survival program, said she was on welfare because she was just doing this out of like pure love and desire to care for our children. And so that's what work is about, like really uplifting, caring for our children. And um, I hope you all are starting to do the same thing. Thank you. Sometimes, like, these kind of heady intellectual conversations, they work for, for some people, but 
one of the issues I had when I first started doing work in the food movement is I found that there were a lot of like class and educational assumptions that were being made in these spaces about how are we going to change the food system, you know? And I, I think that when I kind of ruminate on my own history, when I think about the fact that it was a song that moved me to just kind of turn everything upside down, and I'm like, I'm going to change my life. Uh, that is what did. I feel like I, I need to recite this song to you because uh, I'm, I'm being all like, I need to keep the lyrics for this song that moved me that moved me to think about being a vegan. And it's called Beat. And it's by this hip-hop crew, one of the, the illest hip-hop crews in history called Boogie Down Productions from the Bronx. Uh, it goes like this. Beat. What a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it and you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow. The way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he, fits, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. It gets much more graphic, so I'll stop there. But I just feel like this one song so brilliantly articulated the ills of factory farming and the impact that it has not only on human health but on the animals and the environment and i just you know this whole idea that you know animals are running around in the field happily and they just kind of lay down and go to sleep and then we eat them you know that really just exploded all that and you know i, I understand the power of like literature and oh because then after that my dad i begged him to buy me this cake the kids in here is like they used to have these things back in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he said he buy me the steak if I got if I first would read this book called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, in which he talks about, you know, the kind of horrors of the meatpacking industry in the early 20th century. And so it was a book, it was a song, it was like these type of things that really started to shape my politics around food. And that's one of the reasons that in addition to the food, y'all have a suggested soundtrack, I'll have suggested films and books. I want to give people kind of a multi-layered education that goes beyond just making recipes. All right.